A lot of people know the Rhetorica Ad Herenium as an ancient source for instructions on creating and using the Memory Palace technique or the method of loci. Some people find it easy to understand. They read it once and never need another memory book again. Others pull their hair out just trying to find the memory section, let alone understand the book and the secrets inside of it. Francis Yates called these Memory Palace secrets the Ad Herenium Pattern. What exactly is this pattern? And how does this dusty old book manage to guide those who use the art of memory many thousands of years later? More questions. What did Francis Yates think about this ancient text? And why am I convinced she missed the point when she wrote, all attempts to puzzle out what the classical art of memory was like must be mainly based on the memory section of Ad Herenium. Now, I love Yeats, but this is one of the most damaging statements, one that has locked many readers out of the real riches contained in the Rhetorica Ad Herenium. Am I exaggerating? Well, we're digging deep into exactly why you will benefit most if you take Rhetorica Ad Herenium as a whole. Then you can decide, and if I'm being a bit too dramatic, you can tell our community whether all this Sturm und Drang meant something to you. And for the mnemonic fanatics, we'll figure out whether you really have to mark every fifth station in your memory palaces with a hand made of gold. And we'll explore what might be even better. We'll review Yates' ideas, the Rhetorica Adherinium itself, and explore how all these recommendations connect with many other memory techniques those of us living now have the pleasure to choose from, including ideas from Giordano Bruno himself, who did a lot more than just repeat the so-called Adherinium pattern. And sadly, he too seems to have forgotten the most important parts of the book when his life was at stake and could have used its most impressive tools the most. But I don't know that for sure. History goes as it goes, and as a result, we have the most important guiding question of all. How do we use these techniques to wipe out the ego so that we can enjoy the present moment in fully self-realized bliss? All of these questions will be answered, including what I think we really can call new tips and tricks because they're new to you. And if it isn't new to you, you're not awake yet, as I understand Bruno would have it, and as the spirit of Rhetorica Ad Herenium would have it too. We're diving deep into how all of these considerations will help the serious practitioner experience explosive memory improvement and much, much more, as our series on Frances Yates and her book, The Art of Memory, continues with a commentary on chapter one, three Latin sources for the classical art of memory. Rhetorica Ad Herenium was one of the first memory trainings I read while dealing with a dark depression in grad school. In this video, we'll go through the major aspects that helped me. Some of them are in the memory parts of the Rhetorica Ad Herenium, but a lot of it is from the parts that aren't. In fact, the memory part is so brief, blink and you might miss it. Read sloppily and you might miss each and every point I'm about to share and expand upon. In the memory part, these points are the proper use of wax for the walls of our memory palaces, how to write magnetic imagery into these walls for maximum impact, a better way to think of demarcating your memory palace stations, the need to be a student of your own mental imagery so that you don't get trapped in one modality, and the power of focusing on words and words alone. The question is, why? Why do students of memory miss these points in the first place and fail to extend them to their mostly logical conclusions, as we're going to do right now in this video? Francis Yates tells us in The Art of Memory that the memory training in Rhetorica Ad Herenium is likely difficult for many readers because it was written for an audience already versed in the great tradition. And no doubt, Rhetorica Ad Herenium does read somewhat as if its intended audience were used to hearing memory techniques described as a kind of inner writing. As for the Ad Herenium pattern, it's highly unlikely that this is the first text featuring it. Indeed, if you read Lynn Kelly's The Memory Code, the use of space to memorize information far from new in circa 90 BCE. Even before that, Karen Armstrong makes it clear in her study of the Buddha that the use of locations or memory palaces assisted monks, something the teacher of Tibetan Buddhism Michael Roach has reflected on in his lectures. They linked temples and specific locations in them with mental routines worked through in a systematic pattern as elegant and intricate as mandalas. 
Whereas Yates will accuse Bruno Giordano's memory palaces of appalling complexity. If you know what you're doing, they are always easy, effective, and fun, even if they look torturous and navigationally impossible to an outsider. I take such shortcuts too when teaching these techniques. It's actually impossible to know who knows what or to know without testing just what they understand about the techniques. For this reason, memory competitions are fun and you learn so many secrets when bump and fists set the table with people who have better skills than your own. Show them you're doing the work and they will help you raise your game. Then there are rhetorical assumptions. For example, me diving in as if you know the name Giordano Bruno because I also assume you know the title of this wonderful and problematic book, The Art of Memory and the Rhetorica Adrenium. Assumption is just one risk of teaching and any form of communicating. Fortune favors the bold, but the costs seem to be growing higher. We must all use shortcuts and we're coming to crave them more and more. The brain's impatience with context mistakenly makes the mind want to get to the point. When it comes to memory training, this is an unrealistic urging. Training is training, which means it never ends, and all the less so when you consider the demands of our ever-growing bodies of information. Content may well be king in this environment of endless online education materials, and we do need to try our best to get the information quickly and efficiently. But life is not efficient, and neither is information. And sorry, king content, but from a neurological perspective and how we really learn, you can sit there on your throne all you like. Context is God. And because Yates didn't use the techniques herself, she leaps upon an idea propagated in the content of Ad Herenium and other classical sources of memory without the context of a personal memory practice. As a consequence, Yates narrows our focus on the annoying and unhelpful idea of artificial memory, a conclusion about memory and memory techniques that Giordano Bruno helped us permanently destroy as we discussed in video one of this series. If you don't know who Bruno was, here's briefly the context that should rule us like a god so we understand the kingly content he created for us as memory practitioners. Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake in the year 1600. Burned not because he was a master of memory, but because he used memory as part of becoming what we might call enlightened. And because he was enlightened, or at least his works show all the telltale signs of an awakening, he exposed what the human experience really is and condemned those who prevented scientific living. He also dissolved this false duality of natural memory and artificial memory with the implications of his pantheism. I've personally destroyed this false notion in my personal memory and meditation practice to great benefit. But who am I to speak so forcefully about matters of memory and the freedom of mind they create? And what makes this talking head a worthy provider of ideas that can help improve your practice with these techniques? The name this unit was given is Dr. Anthony Metivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. I have used these techniques for nearly two decades, not merely to help complete my PhD, learn languages, and memorize everybody's name when I waltz into rooms. The art of memory helps heal broken lives and fortify the body and the mind against the torments of the world. It helped heal mine, and in part two of this playlist series, you'll discover that the Rhetorica Ad Herenium is about a lot more than just memory, so if you're new here, Get subscribed now, hit that thumbs up, and for the love of memory, enable notifications so you don't miss a thing. And welcome to part two of the new art of memory. Now, people make the mistake of reading online editions of this book and searching for the word memory. But the Rhetorica Ad Herenium contains many treasures. For example, you learn about argumentation, and this is the key to understanding why and how the memory techniques are delivered in this book. For the audience of this book around about 90 BCE, persuasion was the name of the game. What is persuasion? It is getting someone to accept a suggestion, remember it, and take action on it in a way that creates the desired result. And that's just the point of persuasion skills that impact memory. If you don't remember what the persuader puts in your mind, it's almost certain there won't be a next time. Now, there are different rules and principles of written and spoken persuasion we can commit to memory that helps us improve the ways we guide people to respond and create our desired outcomes. To read Rhetorica Ad Herenium for the memory parts without also understanding the persuasion component seriously diminishes your progress. You miss not only the art of persuasion, but the chance to learn how to share your values so that the vast inventories of mnemonic associations you create for use in your memory palace networks help improve the world. Speaking personally, 
This book has helped me use the same persuasion skills so essential to the art of memory to help people learn the memory palace and integrate it into their everyday lives. But there's an issue we need to address before going any further into the nature of these tools and techniques. Sadly, some people still perpetuate the myth that Cicero wrote this text. As a memory expert, I also make mistakes, and we'll talk about the value of mistakes, but we're supposed to be observant, do our research. And it's a surprise that many people who have read The Art of Memory still think Cicero wrote Rhetorica ad Herennium. Frances Yates herself pointed out the unknown authorship status of this text, and it's very important. That said, Yates many times makes it confusing in The Art of Memory because she refers to how many of the memory authors throughout history referred to Tullius which was Cicero's name, and so we get a proliferation of confusing references that lead to an abundance of mistakes. I'm not sure even I can track all the ins and outs based on how she seems to be taking shortcuts as she addresses an audience she assumes knows the historical periods under discussion. These confusions, when we get our egos out of the way, represent pure treasure. So many thanks to Geert Yan, who helped correct an issue in video one of this series. Rather than spend time on the exact nature of the mistake now, I encourage you to go back and read the discussion and notice how his wonderful comments show precisely the scholarship I was asking for at the beginning of that video as we reread Francis Yates together. I'm deeply honored and also want to thank those who have started supporting the channel as members. Your first exclusive posts are live for you now on the community tab. I hope you're also seeing my shout outs for you on our live streams. When I made the call for participation in video one of this series, I had the Rhetorica ad herenium in mind and was delighted when Geert Yen gave us an elegant example of how education can evolve online. Notice that there's another discussion beneath video one that fails to reach such a powerful and helpful conclusion, a sign that the person leaving the comment does not know the art of communication as Geert Yen does. For you to learn it, the trick lies in remembering the structures of what makes a persuasive argument or act of communication effective. According to the rhetorical tradition described in Rhetorica ad Herenium, the premise of any argument should be relevant, sufficient, and acceptable. Whereas Geert Yan's comment fit these categories and created a positive result, the demands of the other person were none of these things and did not reach the desired outcome. To memorize these three points so you can communicate and get the results you desire, a simple memory palace will suffice. If you know both Ars Memorativa and Ars Combinatoria, you can simply place each on a loci or magnetic station in a memory palace. I'll give you an example in a little while, but first, this is very important to understand. Loci were used by ancient orators or professional persuaders to serve as the sources of various arguments they might want to make. They would memorize not only what they wanted to say, but the actual structure of relevant, sufficient, and acceptable propositions. Often these were implicit or enthymemes, which are arguments in which one or more premise is not explicitly stated. There are at least four types of enthymemes described by Aristotle, but the point here is not to take us deep into these weeds, but so you can understand that the kind of structure the speaker selected was stored in memory and decided upon to suit both the audience and the desired outcome. It is kind of like a game of mental Lego in which the message needs to match both the public and the moment in which the message is delivered. Since memory techniques were so much more prevalent and used in the ancient world, people's minds were filled with all kinds of combinations. They carried inventories of values, for example, and new rhetorical structures that would induce you to either share them or run screaming. These would press on your senses of reason or stimulate your passions. All of this was techni, from which we get the words technical and technique. None of this is philosophy, but specific methods for convincing others to arrive at specific conclusions. And you needed a very good memory to master technique and handle the demands of research. You would need to know both arguments and counter arguments. You would also need to know how to invent on the fly, especially after judging your audience. Were they young and impatient, entirely driven by their appetite? Or were they outwardly ambitious, but completely lacking in discipline? Perhaps the audience would be too optimistic. Imagine stadiums filled with people who had yet to live long enough to see truly tough times. The effective speaker would require good technique to convince the audience to change their ways so that they could survive during the next plague, drought, or famine. Then there are the shrewd and skeptical audiences, filled with opinions, frustrated by long experience and yet lacking in wisdom. 
such audiences brought a dearth of insight. Perhaps their lack of wit caused their misery in the first place, making them people bitter with the gods, doomed to live in fantasies of poorly remembered, better times, lifelong slaves to their hatred of a successful aristocracy. Not much has changed, has it, magnetic friends? The skilled speaker still needs to know how to address and persuade such audiences too. The question is, how? Quite simply, actually, the Rhetorica Ad Herenium teaches us to learn and memorize the structures of ethos, logos, and pathos. Often called the rhetorical triangle, we use each peak to create a different connection between speaker and audience. Ethos involves appeals from character. For example, there are memory trainers who think you'll be more likely to buy their books and courses because they hang out with celebrities. Or maybe they'll talk for hours about their stories to invoke their superior abilities to triumph over diversity. These are the tools a speaker uses to convince the audience that they are ethical, reliable, and worthy of trust. I use such tools too, citing Tony Buzan's mentorship and the incredible award he gave me. And make sure you know that Joshua Four mentions the warrior of the mind emblem in Moonwalking with Einstein. But others use these tools in ways that create feelings inside you that is completely designed. The memory trainer pictured with actors who had superior memory long before that teacher's courses even existed explains why you feel so empty when they've unlocked your trust and yet failed to deliver. But ethos in the form of celebrity association works because it makes you and the audience feel like you share a related interest with the speaker at a primal level. Maybe you even feel identical to the person or have a vicarious experience as you listen to them speak. Or maybe you wish you were hanging out with the celebrities they've been able to meet. It bypasses your critical thinking and you never say, hold on, why am I buying courses from a memory trainer pictured with actors who already had great memory abilities and not from the trainer who helped turn a retiree into a memory champion? Ethos is the answer. That and a huge marketing budget for running ads and later probably selling you supplements on the back end on the strength of even more emotional appeals. If you remember one thing, it is this wonderful phrase, caveat emptor, buyer beware. Whereas ethos appeals to your emotions, logos appeals to your sense of reason. Facts, statistics, survey data, even historical information can all be used to help lead you to making a particular decision. Whether any of this memorized data is true, well, that's another matter entirely. And the speaker needs to always remember that you can't be too on the nose about things. You have to allow the audience to reach its own conclusions and give them the pleasure of anticipating the point. Here you break things down into units of thought using enthymemes that leave just enough unsaid so that the mind of your audience fills in the gap. Analogies also play a role here, but they usually represent the weakest form of persuasion because they rely on common sense. The writer of Rhetorica Ad Herenium already knew way back then that common sense wasn't so common. So advises us to start with the places you have in common with the audience through analogy and stack them on with caution as you follow the response of your audience. Remember, right time and right message for the right audience or mood of that audience, noting that all three factors can and will shift, often as a result of what you say and how you're saying it. Remember. Content is king, but context is God. Analogies may be a weak form of persuasion, but remain tied to the memory tradition. The word topos, which means place or location, possibly derives from the act of memorizing a great number of analogies using magnetic stations in memory palaces. If you had 10 analogies to memorize, you might use 10 spots in a room. By recalling the journey from station to station, you could also remember the analogies. Aristotle himself talks about the technique several times in the context of persuasion. In a book called Topics, we read from Aristotle, For just as in the art of remembering, the mere mention of the places instantly makes us recall the things, so these will make us more apt at deductions through looking to these defined premises in order of enumeration. This point comes up again in On the Soul, On Dreams, and of course in On Memory. For those of you with Magnetic Memory Method Mastermind access, there's an entire course on Aristotle and memory in this program. Dig into it if you haven't already, many treasures await. Aristotle, Plato, and myself hanging out with you on video to chat about memory? How's that for an ethos of celebrity association? Shame on me for burying it in the middle of a long video and assuming enough people in the world even hold such figures in high regard or perfect timing for the audience I want to speak to, knowing that the method to my madness 
alienates and confuses some, while perfectly attracting the serious and mature students I want to spend my time and energy on. Chew it over as we discuss pathos. Pathos is what helps stop you from being skeptical about the hard data of logos. Pathos pulls at your heartstrings with love stories, tales of people overcoming great odds, often accompanied by inspirational music and imagery. This technique is often used to help disguise the fact that you're listening to the same old blah, blah, blah you've heard a thousand times before. It's also found in the words that trigger specific feelings. I'm talking about positive words for conjuring excitement, wonder, even love, unpleasant words for triggering emotions of fear, lack, and sadness. Sex appeal belongs to pathos, including half-naked women and muscular men in magazine ads. Although Business Insider has questioned whether or not sex really sells. There's no doubt that persuaders use pathos by tapping into patriotism, pain, and the promise of paradise. Why does Yeats leave all of this incredible data out of her analysis in The Art of Memory? I don't know. It could be her fixation on getting to Giordano Bruno and her strange misinterpretation about a mystical magic most scholars do not think he ever practiced. And it seems Bruno failed to use rhetorical abilities he must have known from this part of the memory tradition to save his skin in front of the Inquisition. Rather than use the tools of persuasion, he seems to have chided them instead, stating in response to his death sentence or so I have read, Perhaps your fear in passing this sentence upon me is greater than mine in accepting it. But Bruno's unpersuasive feat of resilience is no reason for either Yeats or us to ignore these tools. And now you have some of them. There are six more tools covered in Rhetorica Ad Herenium. But before we cover them, let's skip ahead and ask, why would Giordano Bruno, perhaps the greatest master of memory history has ever known, say such a thing? He apparently said these words in a robust voice, exceedingly strong given how decimated his body had become from years of lingering in prison. A sentence cast upon him for little more than pointing out that there are other planets and other stars just like our sun out there in the universe. But it was also nothing so innocent as that. He also demonstrated that because knowledge of the universe appears in us, we must in some fundamental way be one and the same with that universe. Perhaps Bruno failed to persuade because he was changing strategies on the fly. Being questioned by the Inquisition was surely an exhausting ordeal, though Michael White suggests in The Pope and the Heretic that Bruno might have been following the rhetorical strategy of Pietro Pompanazzi. This writer, who argued that Aristotelian logic failed to demonstrate the existence of the soul, escaped execution by claiming that his writings were purely philosophical. Bruno did this too to a certain extent, but prevaricated. He contradicted himself, lied, and even said in plain and direct language what he actually thought, which is that God is an essence, presence, and power that is in all, not as a part, not as a spirit, but unspeakably. Now, as we learn in video one of this series, the non-dual implications of a true pantheism require total fulfillment in the present moment. This is more than some stoic feel-good quote like you might read from Diogenes who wrote, he has the most who is content with the least. This is the knowledge that the very concepts of less and more appear in the screen of totality. Bruno wanted to show that such worldly concepts were unified in a whole because the world itself and all the words and ideas in it appear in you. As a result, all disagreements in this oneness could be resolved with grace. You just needed to use your memory to wake yourself up so you could see that it always already was, and then hold on to that realization. Yates shows us that she knows this about Bruno's conclusions again and again, but constantly steeps the simple and mathematical implications of Bruno's philosophy into the mystical. It is not mystical, and anyone can see for themselves that this screen through which they see the world is the one and only screen they've ever had, and everything you know appears in it and nowhere else. This doesn't mean that the external world doesn't exist, and it only means what it means. But no honest or ethical analysis of what is really appearing in your conscious awareness can claim to see or experience separation. You can only delude yourself that you are separate from anything. What exactly is there to be separate from 
when you simply abide in the now and this one singular access you have to the truth unfolding from within your own experience in this very second. We'll see later in this chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis of The Art of Memory how Yeats' conclusions make Bruno's mind machine for better memory seem far more complex than it is. But first, we must think further through what Bruno might have learned from the Rhetorica Ad Herenium. He used these tools in what scholars believe amounts to at least 30 books. An interesting number given Yeats' belief that Bruno was obsessed with the number 30. I think Bruno was obsessed with the present moment. But I ultimately don't know, and not one amongst us can ask him. And this raises an important point about how I am using tools of rhetoric to speak about Bruno and the memory tradition. Yeats has come under fire many times for casting a version of Bruno in her own image, rather than what is actually reflected in the evidence, particularly in his writings themselves. As I mentioned in part one, I do not think the implications I'm pushing this to were exactly what Bruno was saying. How could they be the same? They are happening now, in your screen, and I can't begin to imagine how you will interpret them. But despite my lack of control over the outcomes, I want to do my best not to make a similar mistake and invent a Bruno that never was, because I myself have a longing for a certain version to have existed so that I might foist my own perspectives upon you. But such are the risks of teaching and all communication. Such are the risks of thinking through the implications of Bruno's thought, knowing they will match tightly together with other systems of thought I've studied. I think your own research will come to precisely the same conclusion, because it is essentially mathematical. Bruno's pantheism meant that memory itself was God, and I'm pushing it further to say that God is not at issue. If all is one, that too appears within the screen. I've discussed the path I took to reach this conclusion and all the suffering it took to finally reach lasting peace in the victorious mind, how to master memory, meditation, and mental well-being. You can get your copy on Amazon using magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM to direct you to the Amazon store in your country. And now let's tackle the mystery of why Bruno didn't use the rhetorical strategies taught in Rhetorica Ad Herenium as he stood before the Inquisition. All of them can be seen in Bruno's written words and they've appeared multiple times already in today's video. Please allow me to show you what I mean. Take notes and memorize them, because they are very powerful. It all starts with Exordium. This is how you grab attention and establish your credibility. You use ethos to appeal to yourself, and we see this right from the beginning of Bruno's De Idumbris Iderum, or On the Shadows of the Ideas. Celebrity association appears in this book in the dedication to King Henry III. Bruno invokes Merlin, Hermes, Cicero, Aquinas, Magnus, and more. On the Shadows of the Ideas opens with a play, a story with different characters who establish certain rules. Their arguments are more memorable in narrative form, and the most important of these rules is spoken by Hermes, who says the book is not just about better memory, but opens and introduces a way to the discovery of many different faculties. <laughs> that it does indeed. The story form is also used to warn the reader against coming to the wrong conclusions, precisely the kind of mystical conclusions Yeats arrives at. Hermes says, Giordano, they will say you are talking about spinning or weaving the soul. Similarly, certain others will puff out their cheeks, drawing on the fruits of their self-discipline in order to hold in a hostile comment which I wish they would let out. <laughs> well, Bruno, we've got the Amazon store now, and all kinds of people are filling it with their uneducated puffery and opinions about the memory tradition, often commenting on books they never read or read in completely, and without executing their exercises. You might have gotten what you wished for, even though it still remains harder than ever to get the people who need the techniques the most to pay attention to the details. Which draws our attention to a wonderful note of hope for the reader of this text. As Bruno says, through the persona of Hermes in the narrative introduction, there is nothing here or in any of our other arts that should give people who are skilled in our philosophizing any difficulty in understanding, provided that they pay attention. This brings us back to the strange mystery of why Yeats never used these techniques herself before writing The Art of Memory. Had she perhaps read more of Rhetorica Ad Herenium, she might have noted that the best persuaders and teachers address the audiences most suited to their messages at the right time, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
try to speak to everyone and you speak to no one. And not even the strongest narrative can address everyone in the world, which is why Bruno is so clever in setting up this narrative in On the Shadows of the Ideas for an audience who would have known precisely who and what he was talking about. This means setting up who or what you agree with and with whom or what it opposes. In a backhanded way, Bruno uses the persona of Hermes to cause us as readers to question the strength of Platonic and Aristotelian ideas. He says that we should expect to see much better works from people connected with such disciplines and cajoles those who would invent new things. In this book, he counsels that we put invention aside in favor of helping people find, not necessarily create, their magnetic imagery. Many people attempt to learn and mentally recreate Bruno's memory systems, but I think they would do well to reread this book. As he says, of all things that strike the memory forcefully, we must put figuration first. Therefore, simple, intelligible subjects are represented by images of sensible subjects, that they may become like the wheels and flames of Ezekiel. This is neither license nor invitation to use Bruno's imagery or anyone else's. It is the instruction manual for discovering your own based on your existing mental content. There is nothing to be created here, and it is impossible to create when you realize that you are one with the external world, or put differently, that everything in the world that is sensible to you appears to you and in you. As Bruno says, put figuration first, which means finding the images that make sense so they can be like his imagery in potency. If you know the reference to Ezekiel, fair enough, go with it. But the better understanding is that the wheels and flames are the dramatic and exaggerated images we need as taught by Rhetorica ad herenium. Admittedly, this is not easy to interpret out of the writing, and Yeats doesn't help much by talking constantly about magic and some strange notion that you could pull the energy of astral forces from the heavens down into your own body so you can operate the universe. That is the weak, powerless, and pathetic need of simpletons, the kind of rubes Bruno reportedly despised and chased out of his classrooms. No, no, and a thousand times no. The self-realized individual cannot and need not do such things because that person knows all of it, including knowing that the longing for power appears within the self and is witnessed not by a higher mind, but simply by that which is the witness of the self itself. When Bruno talks about the highest potency for what we now call magnetic imagery, and he called sigils, he's talking about drawing on information that is already in you. And in this section of this video, even if my interpretation of Bruno proves false, this is my way of using the rhetorical device of division to make clear what I disagree with in Yeats. Neat how it all folds together, isn't it? This is Logos again where you use evidence to support your case. I've just given you quotes from Yeats and Bruno when talking about division. To read these proof elements for yourself and fact check my conclusions, I urge you to get and read the following books for yourself, De Umbris Iderum or On the Shadows of the Ideas. I suggest you get both the Scott Gosnell and John Michael Greer translations for the fullest possible understanding. The Art of Memory by Francis Yeats and Rhetorica Ad Herenium by an unknown author. Listen. There's no perfect place to start, but I hope I've encouraged you to start digging in, because that ad herenium pattern Yeats describes relatively well in The Art of Memory, it's different every time you read it described, even if you remember certain points. Remember, repetition is always different, and so many people limit their progress by not going over texts multiple times. For more review that packs a punch, check out five powerful memory improvement secrets from five little known sources. It's a free web class. Register for it now at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash AOM. In this exclusive video, I teach you how to use memory palaces by making them elegant, uncluttered, effective, and in a way that allows you to avoid so much confusion about the foreground and background that stumps so many people. Why are so many people confused? Well, let's look to Rhetorica ad herenium for the clues that might lie in. This is where we use logos to pick our opponent apart. For example, we have the fact that Frances Yates says she never used memory techniques, yet she attempted to reconstruct a Bruno-esque memory palace. Trying to derive and share knowledge about how such a memory palace should work is like a cartoonist building a house with no practical experience of carpentry after reading a book about hammers and nails. I choose this metaphor in the hopes you've already spotted the illusion, one that uses narration 
to make a very big point from the book of Matthew. Everyone, therefore, who hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it didn't fall, for it was founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Yeats hasn't seen in any practical sense the value of what Bruno surely knew from the so-called Adherenium pattern. She built her house on sand. You see, there is no pattern at all for the astute student of memory techniques, at least not as such. Yes, you can space your magnetic stations in this and that way. Yes, you can place a golden hand on every fifth station, but that's missing the point. The bigger training point that the admittedly insider nature of the Rhetorica ad herenium points to in a way that I'm sure you'll see now but likely did not perceive before is this. You can extend the famous wax tablet metaphor discussed by Aristotle and all three sources Yeats discusses in The Art of Memory to the walls of every memory palace you create and use. And we should think about writing into these wax-like backgrounds. We can operate as if our magnetic imagery can be built from letters of the alphabet, which Bruno knew very well is the basis upon which to start all imagery. This is the core of Ars Combinatoria. This is the core of how you begin to weave Ars Combinatoria with Ars Memorativa together. The demarcation of stations, some with golden hands as counseled in Rhetorica ad herenium, confuses the point. All magnetic stations in a memory palace are demarcated by thinking of them in your mind as physical entities. You want to imagine them as being so real you can touch their walls. In fact, no mental imagery is needed at all if you don't want it or don't have it. No visualization. And so many people are locked out of this skill because they're relying on seeing pictures in their minds and caught up in this division between artificial memory and natural memory. There is just one screen. It is yours. Work with it. Treasures will unfold. The fact of your oneness with the singular screen of your experience leads to one key point that leaps out of the page for those who know this tradition and for those who know the parable of the wise and foolish builders. The facts of a memory practice built on proper foundations refutes so much of Yeats and her need to inject Bruno with a mysticism that wasn't there. Her biographer intuits that it might have had something to do with her dealing with world wars and the influence of her father, but we don't have to play Dr. Freud with Francis Yates. Rhetorica ad herenium makes so clear why Yates kept grasping at straws. It tells us loud and clear that you must be a student of your own magnetic imagery so you know what stands out against the backgrounds. And for that, you need study from people who actually use the techniques. You need to implement what you find in your study. And then you need to practice. Bruno says it, and he also says that if you know a better way, go ahead and try it. But the reality is there is no better way than you building the foundations yourself. The Japanese call it Genshi Genbutsu, real location, real thing. Or as it is often translated, it would mean something to us in English like, go and see for yourself. You must, because you are the only one who can. And just as I am using the rhetorical device of refutation through the logos of facts and now a cultural reference to a Japanese phrase, the unknown author of Rhetorica ad herenium hit so much human feebleness directly between the eyes by refuting one of the biggest reasons why some people struggle to learn these memory skills. They don't want a Genshi Genbutsu. They want someone to hand the skill to them on a silver platter. They want Easy Street. They want to download it all like Neo in the Matrix. But listen to ancient wisdom speak from the pen of this unknown memory instructor, someone who is not known to have been photographed with any celebrities. Lest you should perchance regard the memorizing of words either as too difficult or as of too little use, and so rest content with the memorizing of matter as being easier and more useful, I must advise you why I do not disapprove of memorizing words. I believe that they who wish to do easy things without trouble and toil must previously have been trained in more difficult things. Nor have I included memorization of words to enable us to get verse by rote, but rather as an exercise whereby to strengthen that other kind of memory, the memory of matter, which is of practical use. Thus, we may without effort pass 
from this difficult training to ease in that other memory. Words, my magnetic friends, is almost certainly the best place for everyone to start and stick with in their memory practice. And all those who whine and cry that this or that memory book or course doesn't have enough examples, and to the crazy people who ask me to market their books for them because they've packed them with precious illustrations they are so certain will work better than the tradition, with all the tough love I can muster, magnetic friends, the facts refute you too. Sure, the odd handout helps the odd person, and no memory training I've ever created is bereft of examples. In fact, they're packed with too many, if anything. But of the many memory champions I've interviewed on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, of the many books and courses I've gone through myself, none have ever produced a shred of evidence that there is a better way of teaching this tradition than to wisely limit the number of mnemonic examples, which is again addressed in the Rhetorica Ad Herenium. I quote, it is the instructor's duty to teach the proper method of search in each case and for the sake of greater clarity to add in illustration some one or two examples of its kind, but not all. I give a method of search and do not draft a thousand kinds of introductions. The same procedure I believe should be followed with respect to images. This is truth and why I always encourage students to create their own examples as soon as possible instead of getting hung up on mnemonic example addiction which is a very real threat to the art of memory. An example is found in my Name Them All course, where I have the students create mnemonic examples immediately, including for the name Giordano Bruno. Have a look at Yuli Kando's example on the course forum sometime, amongst many others. Students really do need to dive in as soon as possible, because their brains need the victory as soon as possible. We know this from neuroscience regarding dopamine, myelin, and other chemicals related to the opioid receptors that make us feel good when we've accomplished something. Bruno knew this, and that's one reason he developed a reputation for being a bit stubborn with his students. Having read a fair amount of his teaching, I'm sure it was all in the spirit of love for the tradition, designed on the best insights about how learning took place during his time. So much of it coheres with current scientific findings about the brain. And those memory trainers who keep failing you? The answer is simple. They are masters of helping you confuse activity with accomplishment. It's empty calories and you feel engaged because they're spoon feeding you example pablum that may take you a meter, but is not the key to the many miles of knowledge you want to travel over the long haul. But to be fair, I could be wrong on these matters and blind by stubborn ignorance and a rage against the changing of the guard as new technologies come in. For the contemporary wizard, who does come up with spoon-feedable mnemonic examples that actually work for the masses, why that person will not only get the Nobel Prize, that person will be able to buy Sweden. But I think Bruno had it right. Yeats quotes him saying this, and I will quote him too. If you think there is a better way, give it a try, Genji Genbutsu. Don't wait for some technological solution, lest you invite wicked corporate controllers to live even more directly inside of your heads than they already do. And to the sixth part, we have. This is where we sum up and reiterate our strongest points. We give presentations, we write essays, and in these efforts, we need to convince others to accept our points of view. The structures of argumentation we've been covering in our summary of a very ancient text have stood the test of time. And we know this because they appear again and again in more recent books like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People and Michael Port's Steal the Show. When I taught writing at university, these were the structures we encouraged students to deeply absorb in their memories so that they might stand a chance not to be governed by laws, but to participate in writing them so that self-governance held a premium. In our times of so many internet twitchy people, things may have changed. For example, many YouTube experts say that you should never use the words in conclusion because hoi polloi take that as license to skip off to the next video. And the programming governing which video pablum gets promoted to the masses and which treasure gets buried panders to this weak and pathetic neurochemical fact of the human species and its addiction to dopamine. Is it a lack of proper and thorough memory and rhetorical training that explains so much of our current troubles? If so, this lack was always in evidence and likely always will be, lest neural implants force enlightenment upon one and all. And if that happens, there will be no more humans, only self-realized machines. Wouldn't you rather have earned the truth of what your experience really is for yourself? 
This question relates to yet another rhetorical device you would do well to remember, the notion of kairos, or timeliness, which is why I chose now, our time, with its new rats carrying new plagues, urging us to a new enlightenment that is always new when you're awake to the now. Hopefully, in the exordium to the new art of memory, I have created enough goodwill amongst enough of you to have kept you following along. In today's world, it's you plus the machines the speaker must entertain, something a professor of mine named Christian Book called Robopoetics many years ago. Says Christian Book, we are probably the first generation of poets who can reasonably expect to write literature for a machinic audience of artificially intellectual peers. Is it not already evident that the poets of tomorrow are likely to resemble programmers, exalted not because they can write great poems, but because they can build a small drone out of words to write great poems for us? Food for thought, friends, as we write together the new art of memory for both ourselves and the machines. I've been admittedly either weak or too reliant on an assumption about your skills at the canvas of imagination regarding the narration in this installment, but part one pretty much tells all the story you need to know. And remember that Bruno faced fire at the stake, so we might not have to literally or figuratively. Literal fear is not too much in an era of automated decisions when people can lose their livelihoods and identities for speaking from memory. We need to seize, learn, and continue to pass these skills on, taking steps to ensure through our self-education efforts that ignorance never allows for the cults of irrationality to hold sovereignty ever again. The division and the proof and the refutation should all weave together in such a way that you continue to believe Yeats' art of memory is a mighty fine read, which it is, but so much finer when you follow up with at least some of the texts referred to within. It is a syllabus with no end, not a conclusion. I've drawn as closely from Rhetorica ad herenium as possible in this video, with a few hints and tricks from other texts of the memory tradition. There are three in total in chapter one of The Art of Memory. I suggest you read it and come back and watch this video again. Memory expert and memory champion Ron White has narrated Rhetorica ad herenium for you, if you're more of the audio and video kind, but please, don't see that as a replacement to reading it yourself. The true path of the memory master uses multimedia to exploit the levels of processing effect. Read, write, hear, and speak about what you learn, and most especially, memorize it. If you have questions, comments, or divisions and refutations of your own, leave them in the comments below and do it with kairos or timeliness, for the now is always fleeting, and following the speed of implementation rule is how we seize the fullness of life. There's much more to learn about Simonidas of Kos and later special memory palace tips I've learned from Thomas Aquinas, Hugh of St. Victor, and of course Giordano Bruno, with whom we are constantly making a very special collision course. If you read them, read them well. Who am I to say how reading well should be defined? Genchi Genbutsu at MagneticMerryMethod.com as we await our commentary on Chapter 2. The Art of Memory in Greece, Memory and the Soul. Thanks as ever for the view, thanks to our growing body of channel members, and until we speak again, many more thanks to the you who knows what you really are, and keep yourself magnetic.